it up tonight first? somebody from the dead I mean that's that's powerful you know mm -hmm. so I've always you know liked the story but it got it got me to study a lot and last week I wasn't really sure where we was going to end up but it ended up in Lazarus <laughs> so it's one of them deals where I think I'm right where I'm supposed to be at tonight in, the, in this study I know Pastor Gary he's passionate about the story of Lazarus too and I'm sure he'll have a lot of insight even after I get through tonight for next week to kind of go back on his way but uh you know, today I'm going I'm to use, I'm going to do a little bit different probably than Pastor Gary does on the Bible study, but uh, we're still going to go through it. We're going to read it together. Uh, but I want to share some things that I studied on too for my message. And uh, a little intro to it was, you know, we know that, you know, sickness, it runs rampant, you know, in today's time, just like it did over 2,000 years ago. We, we all know that we face trials and tribulations too. <clears throat> from today from disease and illnesses and we, what do we typically do we call on God for relief whenever we're sick don't we you know we just went through one of the biggest pandemics there was in history and that was the COVID we were all affected by that some way form or fashion mm -hmm. well you think about cancer same way we may not have that but we all know somebody that has mm -hmm. so we've been affected by it even though it may not be us personally you know as far as their bodies 
But uh, there's so many things out there that come against our bodies, you know, that can get us sick, get us distressed, and uh, that could cause us to pass. We know a lot of people that's passed from COVID and cancer and just other illnesses. But during those times, you know, those of us that believe in the Lord <clears throat> and His Word, we tend to call out for Him for healing, don't we? You know, there are many scriptures in the Bible that actually support healing, too. I want to read you two of them. It, one of them is going to be in Psalms 103, 2 and 3, where it says, Let my whole being bless the Lord and never forget all His good deeds, how God forgives all your sins and He heals all your sicknesses. And there's another one in Jeremiah 30, 17. It says, I will restore your health and I will heal your wounds. I mean, there's many scriptures in the Bible that talk about healing. And... Uh, now, any, even though there are many scriptures in the Bible that talk about healing, from all of, you know, from about healing, but Jesus, we know that He did not come to us to keep us from all afflictions that there is in the world. We know that. You know, He came to save us from the greatest sickness of all, which is sin. Amen. You know, sin is the only sickness which leads us to eternal death. We know that. So we must remember, you know, God, He came to heal us all whenever He went to that cross. I mean, the biggest sickness there was, He went to the cross to heal us from that sin. So we've all actually been healed. All we have to do is a couple of things. We have to believe. Just like Pastor Gary said last week, first thing in the faith is what we have to do. We have to believe, right? So we have to believe what the Lord can do for us for us to be healed. Can I have somebody read... Uh, uh, John 11, 1 through 6. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus, <coughs> and Bethany, a town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified by thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode, abode two days still in the same place, where he was. Alright. So verses 1 through 6 <clears throat> well it says that Mary and Martha we know that they believed in Jesus and his power. Okay. If not they would not have sent a messenger to get him. Okay. The messenger was sent on their behalf. And then the messenger said unto him the one you love is sick. So the messenger he said this in this way because that they knew that Jesus' love was a firm love, okay? It was a saving love. It was a love that they had not seen before from no one else. So the messenger had to believe in Mary and Martha's love for their brother and also believe that love that they had for Jesus. Do y'all get that? Mm -hmm. So what's very, very important right there for one is they sent a messenger for us to understand that that messenger had to know where they were who they believed in for them to go. So I thought that was pretty neat. But also in verse 4, it says, But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Okay. So I'll just think about that verse there. About Jesus when he died on the cross for us. You know, it was for the glory of God. So that he was glorified through that also. And through his death, our sickness, which is sin, we've been healed like we talked about earlier. Okay. It says also in verse 6 that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So he loved them. He cared for those people. Okay. Well, I need somebody to read verse 7 and 8. Then after that, then after that saith he to his disciples, let us go to... Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, 
the Jews of plague sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? So when, um, why do y'all think that he stayed for two days? Let me get that question out there. After that he had heard that he was sick. I think later on you see it is four days before yeah. Jesus got there. It was four days before he got there, but you know, after they came to him, he waited two days before he had actually well, went to I the disciples. Well, I understand the Jews believe, not to be wrong, so I can correct me, but I, I've been told that the Jews believe that whenever a person died, that the spirit moved around close to their body for three days. Three days. Or so. That's what I heard. Yeah. And just like Jesus said, he had to be in the in the tomb. You know, all the miracles he did, they kept saying, well, give us another miracle. <coughs> give us another sign. Right. That you are who you are. And finally, he said, there's not going to be any more signs given but the sign of Jonas. For Jonas, three days, three nights, and the right. belly of the whale. So it's going to start a man for three days. Right. Three nights in the heart of the earth. Well, one thing, when it says he was sick, it wasn't saying he was dead. No. He waited two days. Exactly. That he was sick. Said he was sick. Yep. There again, that looks to me like that he was waiting. He knew mm -hmm. in his infinite wisdom that Lazarus was going to die. Right. And he was waiting for that to happen so that what he was going to do would be made known. Be known, made known as a miracle. That's what I got out of that verse 4, mm -hmm. where he said the sickness is not for death, right. but for the glory. For the glory of God. God. So there, right. I think he already knew what was He going. already knew what was going on, didn't he? Yeah. He already knew, hey, I'm going to wait here two days. I know it's probably going to take me a day or two to get there. And by then, these people, they're going to know that he has passed, that he is dead. And then I'm going to bring it back. So that's what I, I agree with. Be, yeah. <clears throat> well, also it says in uh, in verse 8, you know, Jesus said, let us go to Judea again. And then the disciples said to him, Rabbi, I let the Jews salt and stone you. And you're going to go there again? So they was kind of scared, wasn't they? Like, hey, we just got stoned. We just got run out of there. You know, but Jesus... He already knows the plan. He knows what's beforehand. He knows what he can do, and he know, already knows what's going to happen. So he's not afraid. He's not afraid. He's already disappeared from their midst. Exactly. On different occasions. Right. And they couldn't put a hand on him. Yep. And it's like it always goes back to say it's all in God's time, and he knows what's going to happen. He knows what's going to take place. Yeah. Well, my, my, my Bible got down here in a study part that said that the Jews normally buried a person on the day of the dead. So, now maybe I missed something, but is when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, was his body on top of the soil, or was his body, was he already buried? Well, he was in a tomb. In a tomb? He yeah. was in a tomb. Yeah, he was in a tomb, so... Yeah, he was dead. I mean, as we get on down through this study in a little while, that's going to kind of be revealed, you know, about how, really how dead that he really was. <laughs> but, uh, all right, and verses, can so have somebody read verse 9 and 10? Jesus answered, Are there not 12 hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. Okay. So there in verses 9 and 10, you know, Jesus, he reassures the disciples about the man that walks by day. He is upright. He is truth. So as long as there's day, we know Jesus has work to do, right? That's kind of like us, right? If there's light, we have work to do. And Jesus knew if he walked in the day, he still had work that he could put forth out there and make things happen. You know, he was referring to the day at this time as life. He knew the time was coming when he would be crucified, I think, at this time. Then he said, but the man that walketh by the night, he stumbles 
So if you think about that part of it, you know, when Jesus was in the garden in the night, that's when Judas the betrayer and the mob came to get him. So we know the night represents darkness. That represents things that happen, I think, bad. But we know Jesus is the light, so he's going to have work to do in the day. So he said, as long as we work in the day, we're going to be fine, right? And then, you know, it, it references light a lot of times in the Bible, too. I mean, one of the major like, verses that I'll, you know, refer back to when it's light is going to be Matthew 5, 16. You know, it says, In the same way that your light shine before others, so that they may see that your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So we know that, that Jesus, he's in the day, he is the light, and he knows that he still has work to do. I think it's even something there for us, for us to remember, as long as we have the day, that we have work to do. And we all know that, you know, darkness and evil, they go hand in hand. You know, the devil, he works in the shadows, you know, to deceive, to kill, steal, and destroy. But we have a God that is of the day, a God that shines bright for all of us to see. So somebody read uh, verses 11, 14. 11 through 14. These things said he, and after that he said unto them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go, that I may awaken him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. All right. So 11 through 14, and Jesus he continues to talk to his disciples. Okay, He tells them that Lazarus is asleep. But I go so that I will awake him. And you know, the disciples said if he's asleep, he shall be well. They didn't know that he was dead. <laughs> so Jesus had to tell them that he was dead. The one thing we got to remember here is just like we got through talking about. The messenger came. He said that he was sick. He did not tell them he didn't tell Jesus that he was dead. So Jesus knew that Lazarus had died by this point without being told. Did y'all get that? Y'all got any questions so far? Not sure if I'll be able to answer them, but. <laughs> well, that, that verse right there just tells us that he is all knowing and all powerful. That's right. Well, he knew that Lazarus had already passed. All right, somebody read uh, verses 15 and 16. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. And then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. I believe here, you know, Jesus, he knew that there was going to be sadness. But Jesus, he also knew the big picture here too. He knew the end of the story. He knew that by him going there was going to begin with grief but it was going to end in belief. Y'all believe that? You know, belief and even one of the disciples is talking about Thomas here. You remember doubting Thomas? <laughs> you know, he get, kind of gets a bad rap a lot, you know, because all, whenever I think of doubting Thomas, I think about whenever he says, I'll have to see with my own eyes to believe. And that's when Jesus said, hey, you know, put your finger here and touch these holes in my hands and in my side and my feet. So, uh, <clears throat> You know, at this time here, you know, Thomas even said, let us also go that we may die with him. So what did Thomas do? He showed pretty much great courage there, didn't he? He said, hey, we'll go. You know, I'll go with Jesus. And we'll just die with him. So that tells you a lot about doubting Thomas. He did have faith <laughs> in the Lord. All right. I need, this is going to be kind of a long reading here. It's going to be John 17 through 32. It's about 15 verses. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh to Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. That Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Martha sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, 
If thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection in the last day. <coughs> Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when he had so said, she went away and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The master has come and called her. But as soon as she heard that, she arose uh, quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet coming to the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. So basically, this, these verses here, 17 through 32, is quite a bit there, but it talks about, you know, Martha and Mary and a lot of their differences, but also some similarities in them. Uh, <clears throat> you know, when Jesus found out that Lazarus had been dead in the grave for four days, you know, he was in, he found this out whenever he was in Bethany. And we know that Bethany was about 15 furlongs, which was about two miles away, okay? But we know when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, you know, she took off. She didn't wait around. She said, hey, Jesus is on his way, so what am I going to do? I'm fixing to leave and go meet him. She didn't wait for him to show up. She was excited, you know. So her faith and belief in him was so great that she had to get to him. That's one thing we need to remember. You know, Mary, she stayed at home. Okay, she didn't leave. You know, during this time was a time of mourning. Jesus was coming, so a sense of relief was found in Martha. So she went forward by faith and hope to meet Jesus. She told Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You know, I think she said this more in remorse than rebuke. Because she believed if Jesus would have been there, that he would not have passed away. You know, she wasn't like, if you had just been here, you know, he wouldn't have died. But she was like, if you would have been here, Lord, he would not have died, is what I believe, the way she said it. You know, she was assuring Jesus her belief in him at this time. If you'd have been here, Lord, he would not have passed away. Well, she, she believed that he could heal the sick, but she didn't think about him bringing him bring back, back to life. life. Yes, sir. That's right. Now, that's why she said, you know, next that I know whatsoever you ask, will ask, God will give thee. In this time here, that's when we see a lot of faith in Martha. So we had belief there in Martha. And we also had faith that she believed if he would have been there, that he would have been healed. What do y'all think about that passage? Y'all halfway agree with that, maybe? Okay. <clears throat> well, in Matthew 7, 7, 8, this is a scripture I found that says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For every one that asketh shall receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. That's something I believe in. I believe in that scripture and that verse. And I believe, you know, looking back on her, she did too. You know. You know, when Martha said to, said this to Jesus, he told her that your brother shall rise again. Now this is in verse 23. Well, in verse 24, you know, Martha, you got to just follow along with me in your Bibles. Martha, she didn't understand Jesus and thought he was speaking of the resurrection. But Jesus had granted her prayer. But she was thinking it in a different way. You know. You see, her belief in Jesus was evident, but she was still missing what Jesus was trying to say to her at that time. She was thinking about the resurrection, not that I'm fixing to bring him back to life, you know. So in verse 25, you know, Jesus goes on to say that he was the resurrection and the life, and that he that believeth on me, though we were dead, yet shall live. And whosoever loveth and believeth in me shall live forever. Then he asked this one question. Do you believe this? <laughs> we have to remember that. Do you believe this? Do we believe that? Most of us in this room say we do believe that, right? And I believe he is, you know, the life. I believe he is the resurrection. I believe that one. You know, he asked that question to her. Do you believe this? So we know that Martha believes in the resurrection, but Jesus was telling her, I am the resurrection, okay? In verse 27, 
It says, <clears throat> Martha then says, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. You know, not one of us in this room today doubts that the Lord has the ability to make a miracle. I mean, anybody in here believe that He don't do miracles today? I believe He can do whatever He wants to when He wants to Himself. You know, is in His timing and His will. If He wants that to be done, I believe it'll be done. You know, what we struggle with, like Martha did, is this: His willingness to do something for her. You know, she believed that Jesus could. But sometimes we even doubt that he'd be willing to do something for us. I mean, we believe that he can do it, but a lot of times we even doubt, are we good enough for him to do that for me? I mean, there's people that saved, and they have a hard time becoming saved because they don't think that the Lord can save them from their sin, mm -hmm. things that they've done in the past. They just can't understand that. They'll never know until they know Jesus. They get that intimate relationship with him that's when they understand that. Yeah. You know, what was you going to say, Jim? Yeah, they just don't believe that they're worthy of His, of his mercy right. and grace. You know, that's, you know, this world is geared for us to, to believe that. You know, it's this, this, this tricks of the devil right there. Yeah. I mean, he can take somebody with the most horrible past yeah. and he can save them and they can be a light and carry God His Word from then on. Mm -hmm. But a lot of us at times, we feel like we're just not worthy of God's love, His mercy, and His grace. But we have to, you know, as believers, we have to believe that before we can actually consider salvation at all, period. It's kind of like what Pastor Gary said. All right, verse 28, you know, after Martha had said those things to Jesus, she left and went back to Mary, okay? In 29 through 30, she said that the Master has come and calleth thee. You know, as soon as Mary heard this, she arose quickly and came to meet him. Why do y'all think that she didn't go with whenever she first heard that Jesus was coming from the very beginning? I, I, you know, I, I question that. Why did she run off with Martha? You know, do y'all, do y'all ever think about that? They were very different, Mary and Martha. Right. One of them liked to stay in the house and do things, and the other liked to go out and do things of the Lord. Right. So I can't remember which way it was, but. Also, I did a little research on that too, that there was a tradition in that time, the Eastern tradition, that if women were, they had to be called before they actually left to go and meet someone at that time too. Mm -hmm. So that was something in that time span, that time period there, that you just didn't run off without being called mm -hmm. as a woman in that time also. But, uh, you know, things have changed a lot since then, praise the Lord. <laughs> but, uh, but we found out earlier that, you know, Martha, she broke the tradition. She said, I see Jesus. I know he's coming. I'm going to meet him. I don't care about no tradition. You know, that's what she said. I'm getting out here. I'm going to see him. Mary, on the other hand, she's a little bit more subtle. She stayed and she waited till she was called and then she went. Okay? <clears throat> All right. In verse uh, 31 and 32. It says, when Mary arose hastily, those that comforted her thought that she was going to the grave to weep. She got up quickly. She was still, you know, in, in bad shape. And they thought, hey, she's going to leave and go to the grave to weep. But when Mary got to where Jesus was, what'd she do? Nice. She fell down to his feet, right? Can you just imagine that picture right there? Being so upset, losing your brother, passed away, all these feelings and emotions. First thing she does when she sees Jesus is she falls to his feet. That touches me. <laughs> and that's what we're supposed to do. We're going through rough times and things. We need to go to the feet of Jesus. You know, you know Pastor Gary he said that many times behind this pulpit about going and clinging to the feet of Jesus. And we need to make sure we do that. You know, whenever I picture that in my mind, just to go back a little bit, you know, I think about a child that's been hurt, you know, and what do they want to do? They want their mama, don't they? <laughs> they want the one that they know that can comfort them, you know, and she knew Jesus could comfort her. That's why she felt his feet. But it seemed like she was a little irritated that he hadn't come on when the, when the young message. Right. You know, when... <clears throat> 
You know, when she clung to the feet of Jesus, I believe that she found relief there. You know, her Savior was there. Okay, in verse 32, it says the same thing Martha said. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. You know, by her saying this, just as her sister had, we know that them two had conversation. you got to think about this. They both said the same thing. So they've been talking about it in a room probably, in the house. You know, if Jesus would have been here, my brother would not have died. They both said the same exact thing. So we know they had conversation. <clears throat> sharing with each other about the Lord. Sounds to me like they was having church. Kind of like what we do, right? Mm -hmm. They was having conversation about Jesus, knowing that if he would have been there, that he would not have died. Both of them had their faith. It was just that they expressed it a little bit differently. A little bit differently. And that's like us. You know, we're all believers, believers of Christ, right? When you know, when we can both read the same passage, and we can have two different meanings, but it, yet it still applies to the Lord, right? And sometimes you can read the scripture one day or a verse or a chapter in the Bible, and it just speak to you one way. You read it a month later, it speaks to you a completely different way. You know, there's something there that it, it's always a living word. That's why it's called a living and active word of God. Because as we read it, it comes alive to us. As we're going through certain things in life, it may have a different meaning as we you know, study it and whatever. And that there again, I think it's all timing on that part of it. You know, God reveals in His timing to even each one of us, I believe. You know, He knows when we're ready, we can handle something, or when we might just need the right word at that time to keep us moving throughout that day. But like I said, though, you know, we, we know they had conversation about Jesus this time right here. They said both the same thing. They believed the same thing. So I believe they were in a room together. I can just picture this in my head. They was talking about Jesus and what his powerful and how, who he was. And if he had been there, that their brother would not have passed away. That's just what I think. <clears throat> you know, that's why we congregate together here too, you know, to build each other up, you know, to expound and dissect and to study God's word so we can have that same faith as they had. If Jesus would have been here, would have passed. You know, what can Jesus teach us in the day and the night? You know, by reading his word, building up each other, you know. I mean, just like we've had prayer down here where we come together and we've laid hands and we pray for people and we've seen those prayers work, mm -hmm. you know. God's power, two or more together, we know things happen. All right, in 33 and 35, we know that uh, during this time, Mary, she was upset. Those that had followed her were upset. They were weeping, it says. Then it says that Jesus was moved deeply. He was deeply moved. His spirit was greatly troubled. So Jesus asked, where have you laid him? They said, come and see. And then what did Jesus do? He wept. You know, verse 35 that's one of the shortest scriptures there is in the Bible. But to me, it's one of the most profound ones that there is. He wept. Why do y'all think he wept? Showed his human side. Showed his human side, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He showed us that he cared for that person enough, that he was moved by that. You know, he had compassion for those people that were suffering. I also, just me personally, I think that uh, after raising Lazarus from the dead, that this miracle would bring the leaders to take action to put him to death. I think he knew that. Once he had this miracle, he was going to have a bigger target on his back, you know, because they, they was already ready to get rid of him anyway. But I think his compassion for those to believe him and who he was was so great that he wept also for us to believe in him. You know, he wanted them to believe in him. He was trying to show them the way. He knows that we don't have a chance of resurrection without without him. You know, I, I still believe in this moment that he saw himself on the cross, sacrificing himself for us too. I believe that. But his love was so great that in this time, he wept for us to live, I believe. Y'all got any questions so far about Jesus' wealth? Y'all got any 
feedback about him about him weeping? Well, over in Hebrews it talks about you know Christ being our high priest, mm -hmm. and he was he was in all points tempted, tried, tested mm -hmm. like as we are. Like you said, even though he was God, he was God manifested in the flesh. He had a flesh and bone body, right? Just exactly what, like what we do. But yet he never did sin. He never did deal with temptations or, you know, succumb to it. Mm -hmm. So, in all points, tempted like we are, but yet without sin. And so, he knows what it's like for us. Right. Yeah, yeah I believe that when he came to Earth in human form, it shows his emotional human side whenever he wept for those that he cared for. I think, uh, you know, but I said he wept, well, it's, uh, I don't think he's weeping for that, uh, Lazarus, because he knew he's gonna raise him from the dead, so he right. was weeping for the sorrow that he was seeing from his, his friends. Right, that's what I believe, that's right. I mean, he already knew he was gonna raise Lazarus from the dead. They pretty much already told him, but they just didn't understand what he was saying. So like Gary said, I mean, he really wasn't weeping for the death of Lazarus, but he was weeping because he seemed though he had compassion for those people. And I believe too at that time, he knew where he was headed. And I think at that time, he probably saw, he knew who he was and where he was trying to get all those people to believe in him, that's what I think. So he had, you know, I think it just brought him tears. All right, and uh, can I have somebody read 36 through 39? Then Jesus said to the Jews, Behold how he loved him. <clears throat> and some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore again groaned in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha the sister of him that was dead said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Right. Because that's another place where the four days comes in hand. And we know he was dead, he was there for four days. Just like Brother Sam said earlier, you know, back in that time, three days, after that, you were considered dead. Okay. We got to also remember back then too, he was placed in a tomb, you know, no air in there pretty much. I mean, it was hot, that kind of thing. So, you know, the decomposition sets up pretty quick after four days, you know. <clears throat> but he says in uh, 39, it says, take away the stone, okay? So I just want y'all to think about this right here. You know, we know that Jesus could have rolled the stone away himself, you know, but he told them to take that stone away, roll the stone away. Well, if you think about that stone, to me, I think that says a lot about sin in our life today. You know, he was telling Martha and us that in order for life to be brought forth, that we have to roll away the stone of sin. So in order for us to live, we've got to take that sin, we've got to push it out the way so we can get to him out of that relationship with God. Okay. We have to move out of the way and get rid of it for eternal living to take place in us. So that's what I believe whenever he was talking about move, to take away the stone. You know, sin is like a stone. I mean, you think about it. It's heavy, bonesome, it's in the way. You trip over it, you fall over it, you can't move nowhere with it. Same way sin is, you can't grow, you know. All right, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm getting kind of hoarse. Okay, uh, can I have somebody read uh, 40 through 45? Jesus saith unto her, said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I know that thou heardest me always, hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, 
that they may believe that thou hast sent me. 43. Uh, 45. 45. And when he thus said, had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and feet, foot with grave claws, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him, loose him, and let him go. Okay. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen <coughs> things which Jesus did believe on him. All right. <clears throat> 44 and 45, it gets back to where this is like the, the major thing that's happening right here, okay? <laughs> I mean, a lot's already happened. We already see faith. We see women that believe in Jesus. We know they believe in Him. they got faith in Him. They know that if He had been there, He wouldn't have died. We know right here at this point here with Jesus, He's fixing to raise Lazarus from the dead. But uh, it says in the... Uh, Jesus said unto her, Did I not tell you that if you believed that you would see the glory of God... So they took the stone away and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said these things. But it, did y'all get this? It says, did I not tell you that if you believed that you would see the glory of God? We've got to believe that, okay? In order to see it, we have to believe in that. He said, Father, I thank you for that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you have sent me. You know, we know that Jesus, he didn't pray very much in the public at this time. You know, he pretty much know he prayed in the garden a lot, you know, at night. <clears throat> so for him out praying in the public was a big deal. Why do y'all think he did that? Why do y'all think he prayed out in the public in front of these people? Yeah. I believe that he wanted to show them who he was praying to and what was fixing to happen by him praying that prayer out loud. He wanted them to witness who he was speaking to and his power, I believe, also. Y'all believe that? Yeah. Okay. So this was a defining moment for sure. When he had spoken this, he cried out loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. You know, look, a lot of people say that if he would have just said, Lazarus, come forth, that all the dead would have arose. That's how powerful that he was. You know, he had to call him by name for him to come out. Come out. But like I said, a lot of people believe that if he had just said, dead arise or come forth, that everybody in the, in the tomb might have come out. You know, <laughs> that's how powerful he is when you think about that. He speaks, things happen, you know. But we have to remember Mary and Martha's faith in Jesus. They believed in him. That's the big deal, is believe. But even though they didn't understand, you know, that resurrection side, they just thought he was the resurrection. They didn't understand that he was fixing to raise Lazarus from the dead. But it was it all goes back to them believing. And then it says in 44, the man had died, came out, his hands and feet bound, linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Can y'all picture this in your heads? Lazarus come forth. This man's been dead for four days. They was worried about him stinking. You know, he comes out with his bound up. All these people there, they see that and they witness that. And he says, unbind him and let him go. Can you imagine people run up there just wanting to unbind him? I mean, there's probably a lot of people at first kind of standing back, probably like, I ain't touching that man. <laughs> you know? Well, when this you morning, know? like, person comes out of there. Right, exactly. I mean, you know, four days dead, you know, he comes out wearing the clothes that he was buried in, and they say, the Lord says, I'm buying him and let him go. That's pretty powerful. That, uh, that napkin, that napkin that they had, wherever uh, Jesus came forth out of the grave, yeah. 
that napkin was folded. It's face cloth. Yes, sir. Face yes, sir. Uh huh. And what I what I understand is, say like if they was having a banquet mm -hmm. or a feast or something like that, and they left the table, mm -hmm. and if that napkin wasn't folded, that signified they was going to come back. Exactly right. By them folding that napkin, they was through. They wouldn't be coming back. And that's right. why when yeah. Jesus came out of the tomb, that napkin was folded. Folded. He wouldn't be back. Right. Yeah. How many of you guys fold your napkin when y'all get up from a restaurant? <laughs> y'all do that? <laughs> I wonder why they bound their feet and hands. On um, Lazarus? Anybody got an answer to that? Why they bound his feet and hands? Body stiffens. Body stiffens. He said that the body stiffens. And that just, you know, I guess that kept it together. You know, so I guess as you decompose, your body it tightens up and Keep everything like this. That's why they bind you like that together. I would say. Close their eyes. Yeah. You know, like when regular water sets in on anybody, you know, it can it can make things draw up in different ways. Even though that might not have been the way that you died, but your body can do some things as its muscles and stuff like that yeah. drying up and stuff. So I'm sure that's why they did binding like that. You know. How did he come forth with his hand bound and his feet bound? Jesus said. I guess Jesus said, come forth. Yeah, I know. You know, that's kind of a question. Yes, so when he got up, it probably just ripped them things, you know, right. whatever he had him bound where he couldn't he move. His head. But his face and his body was still wrapped. Yeah. They probably had him bound with a cloth. Right. Yeah. Probably not wrapped with a rope. Yeah. 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 Because Jesus had to come and unbind him. And, you know, his grave clothes was, uh, Jesus, I'm talking about, was left in the tomb. Mm -hmm. But didn't they also, those grave clothes that they wound them up in, or whatever they did, didn't they also put you know, spices and ointments and stuff on there? Yeah, yeah that's usually what they did. <laughs> you know, they. They use spices and all that ointments and all that kind of stuff there to keep things more preserved, you know, at that time. So, well. Uh, and then it says, after this event, here it says, many of the Jews which had come to Mary and had said these things which Jesus did, what they do? They believed. They believed. See, a lot of times, folks, we, we see stuff, we believe it, don't we? Mm -hmm. On our own eyes. It kind of like that with Thomas in a way. We have to see it in order to believe it. You know. The fact of the matter is we got a God. He's around us all day. All we do is open our eyes. We get blinded a lot of times by things. The world's a big thing we get blinded by. The fact is we open our eyes up and look for Jesus. He's there. We can see a lot of things. That's kind of like UFOs. If we hadn't seen one, we don't believe it. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that verse right there points right back to verse 6. Right. Where he delayed his departure. He knew, again, in his infinite wisdom, the impact that his action was going to have at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe this. I believe that, you know, it goes back to even verse 35 when Jesus wept. Mm -hmm. Just like I told you guys earlier, I really thanked him once he did this miracle right here. He knew that they're going to be coming after him. He done fed the fire. He done done all these miracles and all this stuff. And then when he raises somebody from the dead, and they got a whole lot more following because everybody wants to go see a man that's, that's been in the grave for four days. Mm -hmm. Think about how many more people that believed there, even after they went and told those people. The following was fixing to get a lot larger. And these people that was against Jesus that wanted him dead, they knew that. So I think that Jesus, whenever he knew, whenever he did this miracle right here, that was that was like the final straw for him. He knew that they were going to be coming after him. And I think that's one reason why it says that he wept. I think he knew that at that time. It unfolded in his eye. He knew what was going to happen. And he knew this great following was going to take place. And he knew that those people did not want that following. So they're going to come after him a lot harder. So, y'all, what do y'all think? Mm -hmm. uh, I've already talked before that when, when Jesus wept, it was because of unbelief. Right. I had 
got to tell me he believed in Jesus and everything, but that Jesus walked the earth, but he said he didn't believe the Bible so much because it was written by man. So that's yeah. just not saying it, you know, he didn't believe it. Right. Yeah. Well, that's like, you know, just like Pastor Gary left us on last week whenever he talked about believing, you know, we have to believe, you know. And this story right here is just belief after belief after belief. Mary and Martha, you know, many believed after Lazarus. You know, it just talks about believing throughout this whole chapter right here pretty much. But, uh, I mean... I've also heard it talk that he wept because he knew what Lazarus was coming, where he was, and what he's coming back into. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you think about him being dead for four days, okay? Y'all ever thought maybe Lazarus might not want to come back? <laughs> you know, that question was asked me last Sunday, you know, whenever I, I preached a message on Lazarus, and they asked me, they said, what do you think? You think well, he was mad because he came back, he had to come back to earth, you know, during that time? Uh, we don't know. The fact of the matter is, this whole thing right here is about believing in the Lord. It's about believing in Jesus. In order for us salvation, we had to believe. And Mary and Martha, they had faith in Jesus. They knew if he'd have been there, he wouldn't have passed away, even though he didn't understand that he was fixing to bring him back. But their belief in him is actually what prompted, I believe, of Jesus raising Lazarus back to the, from the dead. Because these people, when they sent that messenger, we got to go back to this. He sent the messenger and that messenger had to know that they believed in him enough for him, for him to even go, you know. So I think these two people, they knew Jesus, they believed in him. This probably community there knew that they believed in Jesus. So it was basically, I think, the prime example to show that community and those people there, if you believe in him, what can happen? It kind of set the stage, I believe, you know. Jesus knew. We know by reading this and looking back, you know, but Jesus knew at that time exactly what he was going to do, how he was going to do it, and he already knew the outcome before it was ever put out there. That's who he is. And that's just like us in our lives. We have to believe in him. We have to put our trust in him. And he knows he's going to do whatever he can for the best outcome for us if we do that. A lot of times we get in the way, you know, we get in the way of blessings, of a healing, a lot of things. We, we get in the way of that. We have to make sure we, we stay straight with God, stay straight with the Lord, and keep our faith up and believe that, hey, we are good enough for that healing. We're good enough for Him going on the cross to die for us, ain't we? So we're good enough for that healing. So y'all just remember that tonight. You're good enough. The Lord wouldn't have died for you on that cross if He didn't believe that. So you're good enough for that healing that you're asking for. Anybody in here is hurting on something or whatever, you're good enough for that healing, okay? That's really all I got tonight. I'm going to leave it open from 45 on. I know Pastor Gary, he wanted, he likes this Lazarus story. And that'll leave him where he can come back and touch where I missed, what I missed out on <laughs> for next week. But, uh,